Get Rich Education is brought to you by Norada Real Estate, International Coffee Farms, and Corporate Direct. Garrett Sutton here, Robert Kiyosaki's asset protection attorney and the author of Loopholes of Real Estate. As an American or foreign-based investor in U.S. real estate, you know we are a litigious society. You know that you need to protect your real estate and paper asset holdings with the right mix of LLCs and corporations. My firm, Corporate Direct, not only forms these entities, but importantly, we properly maintain them too. If you fail to follow the corporate formalities, you can lose it all in an instant. Corporate Direct is your source for LLC protection and maintenance in all 50 states. Visit CorporateDirect.com or call 800-600-1760. Mention Get Rich Education for a free bonus. Switch your resident agent service to us and receive another bonus. It's all good. We look forward to assisting you at CorporateDirect.com. Welcome to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold giving you information and ideas on the investment that has turned more ordinary people into millionaires and billionaires than anything else and can provide you with more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, and educator, Keith Weinhold. Welcome to Get Rich Education, episode 83. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold, back to help you responsibly build your wealth through passive income. Turnkey real estate investing can be a great place for one to start investing. That's when a provider connects you directly with a property that is already newly renovated with a tenant in it, already under management for you, and that should produce passive income for you on day one. Easy. Ta-da. You've got mailbox money. Well, no wonder that today the best turnkey providers have waiting lists because what investor wouldn't want more of that situation I just described, okay? Even seasoned investors want to buy turnkeys. Well, most turnkey providers specialize in offering you single-family rental homes. Now, to achieve financial freedom yourself, At, say, $250 of cash flow per turnkey home, do you really want like 40 single family homes in your portfolio to get to $10,000 of passive income per month? I mean, maybe you do. Some people do it that way, and there's nothing wrong with that. But just consider that that's 40 roofs to maintain, 40 insurance policies, 40 properties on your tax return, and so on. Even with a property manager, you're typically still your own asset manager and 40 homes, that might slow you down administratively. And remember, here at Get Rich Education, we're concerned with your return on time invested here. At some point, you may want to turn a bunch of your little green turnkey houses into one red apartment building, and it's important to think about what you might want next down the road so that you can start skating to where the hockey puck is going in your investment life, okay? Now, with, say, a 10-unit apartment building, you might have the same amount of rent income in that apartment building that you did with 10 single-family homes. But see, you have advantages with the apartment building operationally. Your property tax on the 10-unit building, that's not going to be 10 times what it costs on one single-family home. On the apartment building, you might only pay four times the property tax and four times the insurance cost on that apartment building, even though you got 10 times the income. So with an apartment, your expenses per unit are lower than they are with single-family homes, yet you have the same income, your management fee is likely going to be lower with apartments than it was with single families as well. And this is when you start to exploit and enjoy the efficiencies of having many rent incomes all housed under one roof. That results in a higher cap rate and you get more profit per every dollar that you've invested into the deal. Now, as a person that owns both apartments and single families myself, I know that there are downsides to apartments, okay? Arguably, you need to have a better manager for an apartment building than you do with single family homes. If you've got 
10 single family homes, well, then one noisy tenant or tenant that has a barking dog, well, they just don't affect the families around them because the families just live further apart from each other in a single family home neighborhood. In apartment buildings, a manager, they have to be aware of what we call a tenant mix, okay? Don't put the 20-year-old tenant in the unit right above the 80-year-old elderly tenant. One tenant that plays loud music can make others want to move out. And any tenant that plays loud music is never bumping Beethoven's classics either. It's usually like Lil Wayne featuring Drake or something, okay? So... Today's guest, Michael Blanc, that's a name you already know because you've seen him on Bigger Pockets for years. Michael and I are going to chat about apartment buildings both as the investor yourself and if you don't have the money to invest yourself, how you can be an aggregator of other people's money, also known as real estate syndication. I'm also going to ask him about hidden profits that most real estate investors simply miss. Michael is in his homelands of Metro Washington, D.C. today. That's Northern Virginia. I'm in Anchorage, AK. Let's meet Michael Blanc. Well, today's guest is quite well accomplished. He joins us from the Washington, D.C. area today, Northern Virginia. Before becoming a full-time entrepreneur, he was a founding member of a successful software company that went public and achieved $200 million in revenue. He's been a full-time entrepreneur and investor since 2004. He owns apartment buildings in Washington, D.C. and Texas and has syndicated three transactions. He's owned eight pizza restaurants and has renovated and sold over 30 single-family residences, mostly with funds from private individuals. He teaches others how to invest in apartment buildings and offers a bunch of free resources at themichaelblanc.com. You already know today's guest's name because he's also a regular contributor at Bigger Pockets. Welcome to Get Rich Education, Michael Blanc. Hey, thanks very much, Keith, for having me. Yeah, it's great having you here. Let us know about your story. How did you get started? What is the Michael Blanc story? You know, I got started, quote, late in life, and that's because I was following the herd. And awareness came late to me in life, you know, and uh, I guess the key lesson for me is that it's uh, for everyone, it's not too late to change your life. But but really, you know, I was taught to do what most other people are taught to do, which is go to school, get good grades, get a good job. I was never around any kind of entrepreneur. So I, it, to me, it wasn't it was never on my awareness level. And, you know, I, I figured out really late in life that I was actually an entrepreneur and I, I was about 35 when I realize it to the point where I took action. That's kind of right when I read the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book. And I was like, God, I am such an idiot. You know, it doesn't really matter how much you have in the in the bank. It has it matters how much passive income you have. And my vision, you know, because I have a software background, was to be a CEO of a software company. And I pursued that for some time and moved around inside my company. I grew up, you know, in the the software development, uh, managing people because we were growing so rapidly. But in the end, I spent some time in marketing and, and also sales. So that was kind of my vision. And I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad and just hit me upside the head. And I changed my entire strategy. So I said, you know what, I'm going to pursue this with, with all that I know how. And because I had some some money from a software IPO, I decided to essentially quit and pursue full time pursuing this. And I just said, well, I'll do the two things that Kiyosaki says. One is, you know, real estate and the other one is some kind of cash flow business. So on the cash flow business side, I decided to get into pizza restaurant franchise. And I met other people and they said, look, here's how it works. You hire a guy to run the whole thing. And, uh, you know, you build them or buy them and he runs everything and you sit back and you know, you count the passive income. I was like, sweet, that's exactly what I want. Right. So my strategy was, you know, a 20 unit plan. I, I have enough cash to maybe, you know, build or buy three of these restaurants. They would then self fund themselves and I would open up one a year and then maybe on it would accelerate. So I had this giant spreadsheet and that was essentially my business plan. It wasn't really so much real estate at the time. It was, that was it. That was the one big thing. Now it didn't work out that way. We can maybe talk about it later. On the real estate side, I decided to flip houses. So I signed up with a, a local mentor and I flipped a couple houses and I was just amazed at at that business and how that worked because I was successful early on, maybe got a little lucky, that's fine. And so then the recession happened and luckily I wasn't holding any real estate, but I was holding restaurants. So that left me a few battle scars because at the time we were at six restaurants and I had to sell two at a pretty significant loss to kind of cut the bleeding, which I did. And then I also got started with commercial real estate because I felt 
on the passive income side, Keith, is something I really wanted to do early on, and that was commercial real estate for me. So I started looking in Texas and doing a lot of marketing, and I took a boot camp and, and started looking for deals in Texas, looked at probably 150 deals before finally I got verbal agreement on an 82 unit, and it was a smoking hot deal. <laughs> and I was like, wow, if I move forward on this, I'm going to have to spend some time in Texas. And we were so busy on the restaurant side that I said, okay, putting the whole real estate thing on hold for a little bit and a focus on the restaurant side. Fine, be that as it may. By 2009, the restaurants had quieted down a little bit, and that's when I was able to pursue the real estate again. And I did so, but at that point, I didn't have any more remote money. It was all deployed. It was all in these restaurants, for better or for worse. At the time, it was for better. <laughs> and uh, in retrospect, it was, it was for the worse. But So I had none of my own money, uh, but I, the market was so unique, and I wanted to flip a lot of houses. So I raised the money, and uh, that's when I first got the taste for raising money. And uh, that's also when I bought a 12-unit apartment building, also with investor money. And in fact, I even bought two pizza restaurants as well, uh, also with investor money. So I've raised about $1.6 million for three different kinds of businesses. So I've done a lot of different stuff, and people kept asking me, hey, how do you do this? How do you raise money? How do you syndicate deals? How do you look for deals? And then two and a half years ago, I decided to simply share that with people and started blogging on the bigger pockets, and then eventually started uh, actually creating a presence around that and teaching other people. So that's kind of my story in a nutshell. Yeah, well, that's great. And it sounds like, as I'm listening to that journey, as you went along, you started to realize a few things. Cash flow and having a stream of income is a lot more important than having a lump at the end of your career. And you can have both with real estate. You know, you saw the value of going and purchasing out of market. And then you saw the value in purchasing apartment buildings. And every investor, as they go along throughout their journey, the same is true of me and the same is true of every listener out there. I don't care how much income they have. One thing happens during an investor's journey, and that is they run out of money. Well, most people see that as a roadblock, but some, the special ones, the ones that think abundantly, they see them running out of money as probably the beginning of their real investing career when they learn how to raise money from others and syndicate that like you've done with apartment buildings. So running out of money is not the end. Often that's the motivation to make it the beginning. With your apartment building niche today, tell us a little bit more about that. How have you grown that out? How do you go about putting deals together? Putting deals together, I mean, that, that's kind of an open-ended question because you as a syndicator, I use the word not real estate investor, but real estate entrepreneur, because that's kind of what we are. The investor right. it kind of implies a little bit more of a passive side, like that you're in the money side. But really, as, the, as a real estate entrepreneur, it's more accurate to describe because entrepreneurs, they make stuff happen out of nothing. That's what we do. And so if you think yourself an entrepreneur, then by default or by definition, that implies that you don't have all the talent, you don't have all the resources, you don't have all the money. So as a real estate entrepreneur, to make deals happen is you're making stuff happen out of almost nothing or maybe out of very limited resources. So really the answer to that question is you need to put together three things. You need to find a deal, you need to raise the money, and you need to put a kind of a management in place. And you as an entrepreneur makes all that happen, and that's generally known as syndication. Well, with syndication, which is basically aggregating and pooling other investors' money, and you match that up with a deal that you found, you know, we're in an environment today where apartment building cap rates have been run down, 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 and the competition has heated up. And there's a lot of people that with investor money that have seen that real estate has been a favorable asset class for quite a few years here. So what's easier to find today, the money from people or the apartment building deal? I think for me and, and others, I think it's the finding the money that's easier right now. Yeah. The number one challenge in the multifamily or a commercial real estate for that matter is, is finding the deals. It's a real challenge. I do believe that apartment buildings is probably the best business in the world to build passive income and long-term wealth. But right now, we're in a season where finding the deals is very difficult. It reminds me of when I started flipping houses in 2005, which was red hot in the residential market. And when I got started, it was all direct mail. It was cold calling. And so when I got started, I was like, well, that's the way you do it, obviously. And that's what exactly what I did. And then I grew lazy over the years, right? So over the years, we had the recession, and there was a lot of supply. There was stuff you can find in the MLS, and there's a whole network of wholesalers that I built up, and I was just having people send me stuff, right? So I got really lazy. And we're in a similar environment that we were in 2005, where you can't just go on LoopNet or you know some other website and find deals. You got to actually work for it. You know, imagine that. So the, the way that people are doing deals today are kind of the old school stuff where you got to hustle a little bit. These are and the deals. The vast majority of deals, ninety percent of the deals, are found through relationships, and those are primarily through relationships with brokers, primarily, 
And these relationships are built over time to the point where brokers will call you with off-market deals. You know, they don't want to do a lot of work either. If they can t call their five top guys, then that's how deals are done. Other ones are through relationships through attorneys or property managers, right? Relationships. And then the other 10% are through stuff like direct mail or cold calling. But really, it's one of those things where you actually got to work to get your deals. And the people are, that are doing deals, that's how they're getting it. But they're not just laying around. Now, some of these apartment building deals, I know they can have a dozen or more legitimate offers on them. So how do you really make your offer stand out? You gave us a few tips there on, you know, go ahead and have a good relationship with the broker and, and basically get a hold of their pocket listings and be in that flow. But I mean, when there's so many competing offers for one building, it doesn't matter if you do well and you have the third best offer out of 20 you need to have the offer that's accepted. So what are some things you do to really make yours stand out so your offer is accepted and you get that apartment building for your investors? There's a few things that you can do, and, and they're not just one answer. It's, it's probably a combination of several. So the first thing is when you do reach out to brokers, you don't sound like a newbie. And we'll talk about that again, but pick up the phone, you talk to somebody, use the right language. So it's going to require a certain amount of education. And the students I've worked with have told me that over time, as they get more comfortable with analyzing deals and the terminology that they use, people take them seriously. And they're like, wow, I, just, I met with an investor today. He didn't even ask me about the fact that I didn't even have an apartment building, huh. right? So it's not sounding like a newbie. It doesn't mean that you have a, have a giant track record, but don't sound like a newbie on the one hand. Number two is if you can have a relationship with a broker, it helps get your deal done. If the broker knows you, trusts you, likes you, right? They're more likely going to recommend you to the seller because the seller doesn't oftentimes doesn't know you, right? So building relationship over time really helps. And in the absence of that, or in addition to what also helps is putting together a solid offer package. And I almost call it like a, like a credibility package. It's not just, let me throw an LOI over the fence and see what happens. Because right. a lot of the times the broker doesn't really know you very well. Hopefully you do know the, and you've met the broker. So you have some rapport with the broker, but you don't have any rapport with the seller many times because you're shielded from that. So really there's, there's things that you got, you want to put in the offer package that helps you. And so I'm just going to describe some of those things that, that might help. One of the things that helps is, is a cover letter. It's a single page that says, Hey, I'm really excited about this deal. Here's what's going to include in the package. Uh, under these terms, I'd be very interested in moving forward. Introducing something about your team, especially we don't have a track record. It's all about your team. So talk about yourself. Yes, maybe you have some success in other businesses, real estate or otherwise, but really talk about your team, talk about your property manager, talk about your attorney, talk about your CPA, whatever, right? Anyone that's in there. So it adds some credibility. A couple of other things you can do is you can include several proof of funds letters and get one from Kogo Capital. So if you go to Kogo Capital, you search uh, Google Kogo Capital uh, proof of funds letter, they actually will give you a proof of funds letter. And, and these proof of funds letter, and I'll get back to that in a second, they're kind of like formalities, right? They're kind of meaningless letters because as a syndicator, you don't have the money sitting in a bank because you're going to get the money to closing, you know, a few days before closing. Right. So a proof of funds letter of any kind is really sort of meaningless, but a lot of sellers kind of insist on it because it weeds out the riffraff. So you can get this proof of funds letter from Kogo Capital uh, costs like five bucks. And the other thing you can do is you can get some letters of intent signed from your investors. So let's say you have a few investors and they're all verbally committed to say $25,000 or $50,000. Send them, uh, have them send a quick one pager that says, hey, you know, Michael's a pretty good guy. I'm going to invest $50,000, of course, after I see the deal and it's signed and whatever. And you include some of those in a package and the seller can see, hey, man, this guy's, you know, is pretty serious about that. And of course, then the letter of intent to go along with it. So there's, don't just send over the letter of intent of the offer, make it more well-rounded, get it so that the person sees that you're serious. And, uh, and obviously price and terms are important also, but, but at the end of the day, they're not the final thing either. Sure. Terms are oftentimes more important than the price. So, you know, you basically, you go ahead and demonstrate that you've been there before, talk the language, have an organized, competent, coherent package. And that goes a long way toward impressing the seller. Anything else about finding the deal? I mean, how do you actually go about finding the deal? Anything else there? Well, like, like I said, the, the majority of deals are found through brokers. And so what, what I teach my students is to actively work on expanding and strengthening those relationships with brokers. Because look, the brokers are in the business of knowing the seller. So they're the ones doing direct mail. They're cold calling. They're going to networking events. They're going to commercial real estate meetings. And, and their goal is to meet 
with owners of apartment buildings, and I just look at the ones because I own some units and I get, you know, uh, letters and phone calls from brokers saying, hey, how's it going today? You know, or you're looking to sell or buy, you know, you want me to give you a free appraisal, <laughs> you know, that kind of <laughs> stuff. So they're in the business of building relationship with sellers. That doesn't mean that you can't do that either. It's just a lot more work and will take more, more time. So really, in the beginning, the strategy is really to identify the brokers. And you can find brokers in a variety of different ways. A great way to, to do that is via LoopNet, loopnet.com. And it's not so much where you find the deals, but where you find the brokers. You can find some on the MLS. You can find some on CCIM.com. CCIM is a commercial real estate designation. There's a director there of commercial real estate brokers. Auction sites like 10x.com is another place where you can find brokers. So the idea is that you just create a spread to these brokers and you start contacting them and saying, hey, here's what I'm looking for. Do you mind sending me a deal and putting me on your buyer's list? That's really what you want to do in the beginning and generate some deal flow. And then you want to you know, strengthen those relationships, meet them in person if you can, build rapport when you can, stay in touch with them. So that's probably the, the number one thing. And when you've kind of exhausted a market and you know every broker in town, <laughs> if you get to that point, then you can complement that with direct mail and other things of that nature. All right. So it's really about building a relationship. So along with the soft skills, there's some good actionable content there too. We're going to come back and talk with Michael about how others can get started in apartment building investing and also some of the best practices for increasing an apartment building's net operating income. You're listening to Get Rich Education. Our guest is Michael Blanc. More when we come back. I'm your host, Keith Weinholt. Kind of breaking news here. Now, this is something exciting. Through Get Rich Education and International Coffee Farms, you can once again own your own half-acre parcels of a passive income-generating specialty coffee farm in Panama for as little as $13,000. The farm will be planted with the most in-demand varietals of specialty coffee in the market today. The farms are professionally managed for you on a turnkey basis, and you own the land. It's a low-risk opportunity. It has an average annual return projected at 12%. And that doesn't even include potential appreciation in the value of the land. I can't officially endorse the investment, but I do own parcels myself, and I've walked them in person. These affordable raw land offerings, they're available only for Get Rich Education listeners through June 30th. That's when the offer goes public to others. In case there are any parcels left at that time, parcels are going to be allocated on a first-come, first-served basis. To learn more, just send an email indicating your interest to coffee at getricheducation.com. Are you looking for a roadmap to financial freedom? If so, we have a solution for you. Narada Real Estate is offering a limited number of free strategy sessions to help you get out of the rat race. Learn how you can create wealth and build monthly passive income. To set up a time with one of our knowledgeable investment counselors, simply go to naradarealestate.com. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com. This is Rich Dad Advisor Tom Wheelwright. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold and don't quit your daydream. Welcome back to Get Rich Education with our feature guest, Michael Blanc, themichaelblanc.com. So, Michael, what are some of the best practices for increasing an apartment building's NOI, its net operating income, which really all comes down to increasing bottom line cash flow? When a successful investor buys a building, oftentimes I like to say they want to see that there's a little bit of meat on the bone. They do want to see that there's some opportunity for improvement there. So what are some of the ways to profit that most investors actually miss? Well, that's that's correct. And the bigger question is, why would you want to uh, improve the net operating income? And certainly one is cash flow, but and that's important. But really what you're doing is you're forcing appreciation, right? I mean, the way that commercial real estate is valued is all a multiple of income. So the higher your net operating income, the higher the value of the property, which makes it very interesting as an investment vehicle. So I can buy something at a, quote, fair market value. And let's say this is something where we use something like a cap rate. Is this this multiple of income? Let's say the cap rate is 10%. And you can take the uh, 10 and you multiply it by the income. Let's say the income of a property is $50,000 uh, per year in an environment where the cap rate is 10%, 10 times 50,000 is the value of that building is $500,000. Now, if I can improve that that cash flow from, say, 50000 to 60000 increase it by 10000 then I'm actually adding 
10,000 times 10 or $100,000 of value to that building, which is really cool. And what happens is when you make minor tweaks to the income and minor tweaks to the expenses, it can have enormous impact on the value of the property, which it makes it very interesting. So that's why you want to do it. Yes, it improves your income, but really, man, it, that's when you start adding real wealth to it. So in general, under the category of reducing expenses and increasing income, there's a couple things that you can do. Uh, on the expense side, you can reduce your water bill. A lot of times these buildings are mismanaged. There's drips and leaks all over the place. So the first thing you can do is go in there and fix all the dripping faucets and leaking toilets and put some water saver in there. It's a really cheap thing to do. I mean, dripping water, if water drips or leaks during the day, times whatever units you have, it can really charge a water bill. And, and the 12 unit I bought was a perfect example of that. Another one is reducing your heating bill. And it really depends on whether the tenants are paying the, the bill or if you're paying the bill. Uh, that makes a huge difference. But if you're paying the bill for them, then they're going to keep their windows open in the winter because they don't care. And so one way to, to do that is you can install programmable thermostats, uh, for example, to reduce the heat or the electricity during night and et cetera, things like that. Yeah. I like to joke that you always know who's paying for the heat in an apartment building. Just walk by the outside <laughs> of the building in the winter. If the yeah. windows are open, you know that the owner's paying for the heat. <laughs> That's right. You can challenge a tax assessment, especially after you buy a property. And let's say you, you buy it for below fair market value. A lot of the times the tax assessment is higher. They're normally pegged on a uh, previous purchase price, especially if you buy it below market. You can save uh, thousands of dollars a year with that. Review the vendor contracts each year, like trash or insurance, because a lot of times when people have been with a building a long time and they've been with a particular provider for a decade or so, it just costs just creeps up. So there's some things you can do on, on the expenses and the income increase side. Obviously, a big driver is increase in rent. So a lot of times we get into deals because the rents are below market, either because it's just has been mismanaged. Uh, the property manager hasn't really been pushing rents or increasing rents, or perhaps it needs some renovations to justify higher rents. So the biggest bang for buck normally is on the rent increase side. And less so, you can do other stuff like install laundry or vending machines that will increase the income as well. At the end of the day, a lot of this is driven by a good property manager. I mean, we can talk about all these different things you can do, but it really comes down to the quality of the property manager. And if you have a good property manager, they're going to look out for you. They're going to push rents. They're going to keep it clean. They're going to push rents as much as they can. They're going to turn it over as quickly as possible. They're going to make recommendations. They're going to watch. They're going to see the leaking water faucets and, and fix them proactively. So while I'm telling you these things, the real benefit is making sure that you have a good property manager. Yeah, that's just the most important part of the team because that's the one member of your team that's there with you for the long term. You know, when one wants to be a successful real estate investor or even a, a successful real estate entrepreneur like we're talking about now, a lot of those team members are only used at transaction time when you're buying or selling, whether that be your real estate agent or your mortgage loan officer or your building inspector or whatever. The manager is the one that you have that long-term relationship with, and it's, it's just so difficult to overstate the importance of that property manager. Now, one thing that gets people interested in turning their portfolio from a bunch of small greenhouses into one red hotel or one red apartment building, as it might be, is as soon as that investor starts to realize some of those apartment building advantages. Like we were talking about earlier, when one increases the net operating income, that not only increases the building's cash flow, that increases the value of the building because the value of a building is the net operating income divided by the cap rate. So when improvements are made to properties of five or more units, we're improving both the cash flow and the value of the property at the same time. And that's something that we just do not have in the way that one to four unit buildings are valued where they are valued on comparable. It increases in rent and net operating income. It really does not translate into an increase in value like it does in apartment buildings. And a realization like that is one of the sparks oftentimes that can really get a person interested in transitioning from a single family home investor and moving some of their equity into an apartment building. So really, once one makes that transition, Michael, how can others get started in apartment building investing? What are some of the things they need to do? Well, there's really three things. Everything is three things, right? People remember three things. <laughs> right. Don't make it more than that or people will forget, right? Yeah, that's right. There's really three things. And number one, and we talked about it before, is don't sound like a newbie. And it, it affects really any business. It's not just apartment building specifically. It's really anything you want to get into. Don't sound like a newbie, which means that educate yourself to some degree or another. 
I have a lot of free information on themichaelblank.com, as you pointed out, YouTube channel, the podcast, and the website, Bigger Pockets articles, a lot of information out there. You may get to the point where you want, may want to invest in your education and take it a step further. Either way, don't sound like a newbie. You can only have one chance to make a first impression, and you start using the wrong words or don't sound like you're talking about, the broker will remember that. So the next time around you call them, you're like, oh, I know who you are. <laughs> you're going to waste my time. So don't sound like a newbie educate yourself first. And then two things. There's two things you got to learn how to do. There's all of things, but specifically in the beginning, two things. One is learn how to analyze deals quickly. And the second one is learn how to raise money from others. So learn how to analyze deals quickly. Here's why this is important. Number one, if you know how to learn to analyze deals, you're educating yourself on the one hand. You're becoming more and more confident with valuing property, figuring out what you can pay for it, modeling different scenarios, figuring out how to structure it with potential investors. And it really, really raises your confidence level in anything you do, the way you talk to potential investors, the way you talk to brokers, the way you make offers, it really affects your confidence level. And when I first got started doing this in 2007 or so, when I started this, it took me way too long to analyze deals. There's some tricks to keep down that analysis, which I'm not going to get into right now. But the more you know, the faster you get with analyzing deals, and the more offers you can make. Because the more offers you can make, as you know, the more likely you are to do deals. So that's the first thing is learn how to analyze deals quickly. And the second thing is learn how to raise money from others. And this is huge because the number one objection from people to get into apartment buildings is they, they'll say, well, I don't have cash or credit or I don't have enough cash or credit. And they, they simply eliminate the strategy from their portfolio and they decide to go single family house routes or wholesaling or some other strategy only because they, in their mind, they don't have the money to do it. And that's a mistake. So I spend a lot of time and I focus a lot on raising money from others because here is the reality of it. There's a lot of cash on the sidelines right now looking for some kind of return. And it's really, really difficult to get that. There's an uncertain stock market. Real estate appears to be overpriced at the moment. A lot of people are sitting on cash or they have a lot of money in their IRA also returning no returns either. So raising money is really not the issue as much. It's really finding the deals right now. But in order, you have a chicken and egg problem, Keith. You, on the one hand, if you get a deal on a contract, people think there's not enough time to raise money, which is true. On the other hand, if you don't have a deal on a contract, then what can you go out to their investors with? And so I solved this problem in this ebook you guys can download later, later on. It's called The Secret to Raising Money to Buy Your First Apartment Building Deal which addresses this conundrum and how to specifically how to solve this problem. But really, it's the third skill that you need to do is to learn how to raise money from others. Because if you can do that, your ability to scale your business is only dependent on your ability to find deals and your ability to raise money. It is not dependent at all on your financial resources or the lack thereof. And that was an aha moment when, when I had when I first got the taste for private invest money. And I was like, wow, this is really amazing, and I really started to focus more and try to hone the skill to get better at raising money. So those are the three. Don't sound like a newbie and learn how to analyze deals quickly and raise money from others. Yeah, that is amazing and a revelation to some people when they learn about syndication and learning how to raise money from others. It basically debunks this as a myth, the old axiom that it takes money to make money. Well, not really. <laughs> not really. Yeah, exactly. Now, I think that intimidates some people. That intimidates some starters. Is there, is there anything you think mentally that helps move a student from a real estate investor to a real estate entrepreneur? That meaning from using their own money for deals to raising other people's money for deals. What moves one? What compels them to really do that? Is there anything with the mindset that helps a person prepare themselves to be a syndicator and raise money from others? Yeah, I do think so. And it's just a feedback I've gotten from people that downloaded this, this ebook uh, I just mentioned. And first of all, some people don't even think it's possible. And if they do think it's possible, they don't think they can do it. And or most importantly, they can't visualize how to do it. If you show someone the steps to do that, and you provide them some resources to do it, they go kind of go, oh, oh, I get it. Okay, so now I, I can see how that can be done. And now I can see myself doing it. And now they will permit themselves, allow themselves to visualize that for themselves. This is why, you know, the value of education is so important. So that's kind of the mindset shift that I see is a little bit of education and awareness of what's possible. And people are going to go, oh, all right, I get it. Now, I don't have all the details figured out yet, but at least I see the outline of what's possible. All right. Well, it's fun to be rosy and optimistic and talk about what's possible, but 
as we know, you know, one certainty in real estate investing is that something is going to go wrong at some point. So why don't we talk a little bit about both your best deal and your worst deal? Let's talk about a deal that went really poorly for you because we often get a lesson that way. What's your best deal and what's your worst deal? It's probably a 12-unit apartment building deal that I bought in Washington, D.C. in 2011, and it started off being a complete disaster. I mean, I, I thought it was the it was going to be the end of me, uh, honestly. It took a long time to close on the one hand. There was a lot of uh, compliance issues with it. It just really re wasn't ready for sale. Dropped in and out of contract a couple times. So it was a nightmare to close. This one was bought with investors. It was syndicated. And, and once I closed on it, I was like, woohoo, sweet, I'm good, right? And what happened is it turned out that half the people weren't actually paying the rent. They were just, I don't know, living there for free. I don't know. And one of them in particular, I don't know, for some reason made his life mission to bankrupt me. I don't know what it was, but he was a professional tenant, meaning that he's figured out how to use a system to live there rent-free for a lifetime. But that didn't appear to be enough. He insisted on calling various different governmental agencies and I had various different inspectors from very different agencies swarming around me. Oh, wow. Fining me and uh, enforcing fines. I had the, the lead paint people there. Then he was suing me in court over the, the same 12 made up housing code violations. And I told people about this, like other experienced investors, and like, oh my gosh, it's like 20 deals in one because of so many things went wrong with this thing. And I did have some cash reserves in a deal, but I almost ran out of it because this guy was creating so many expenses, court fees, repairs, fines. It was unbelievable. And uh, one day, magically, it stopped. It is literally a miracle. And he, he stopped and eventually had, he had moved out. And I, then in the process, I replaced the property manager, which was very disruptive. And the, this place didn't cash flow for 24 months. I mean, I missed my projections by wow. a mile. And it, my, you know, my reports to the investors were like, ah, I'm sorry, there's no money again because of these situations. And it was a complete nightmare. I looked like a buffoon, frankly. And a lot of things that we were doing that was out of control, but it still happened. And after replacing the property management company, things stabilized. We stabilized the tenant base. The property manager knew how to deal with this particular tenant in a way that controlled the damage he was doing and eventually stopped. And we improved the rental income, reduced the expenses, and it finally was able to do 24 months later what I thought we were able to do three months into the deal. And now it's cash flowing very well. The valuation is about double what we paid for. And it's, it's about time to maybe refinance, pull some cash out and, and move on. It's the you know, two in one deal. And a lot of deals are, are like that, especially as people get started. You know, there's some mistakes that they make, some things that are unforeseen and you just kind of figure it out and you make it successful over time. Right. Now, we always like to look back at lessons that would have prevented bad things from happening. Would the issuance of estoppel certificates for each tenant during the due diligence period, could that have alerted you to that one problem tenant that maybe he was behind on rent or he had some other problems that would have hedged that or rather uh, would have cut that off? Yeah, here's the thing about that. I, there was an attorney that I interviewed in the process when I was building a team, and he really tried to talk me out of being in Washington, D.C. in general. And one of the things he said is, you know, make sure you look at the court records for each tenant. I didn't do that. There was a lot of work to do in due diligence, as you know, and that's one of the things I did not do. And had I done that, I would have noticed that this guy, plus two others, were constantly in and out of various courts. Now, the thing is, the big question, Keith, is had I done that, would that have changed anything? And I asked myself that, and I was like, you know what? I was so eager to do a deal that I probably wouldn't have changed anything, frankly. You know, But it's pretty one of those things that you probably would have gone in there with bigger eyes. Probably the bigger thing that would have made a difference is the right property manager. The property manager I had was not did not specialize on this demographic, which is Section 8 housing. In fact, he didn't like it at all, and that was because he didn't know anything about it. And this new property manager specializes in Section 8 and specializes with this kind of you know higher management type demographic. And lessons learned, you know, as it's some of the things that uh, you learn as you go along and you try to fix them. And here's the thing: it's all about making mistakes is one thing, uh, as long as you fix them and learn from them. Those are mistakes worth making. Investors either get the win or they get the lesson, so they benefit one way or the other. Yeah. <laughs> well, Michael, is there anything else you want to tell Get Rich Education Nation that I haven't brought up but I should have? Well, two things. One is it occurs to me I was talking about this free ebook and I didn't tell you where to get it. It's uh, themichaelblank.com. So it's T-H-E, the Michael Blank, and it's B-L-A-N-K forward slash G-R-E which is Get Rich Education. And you can just download the book there. So it's the michaelblank.com forward slash G-R-E, just to uh, complete that thought. The second one is anything else I want to say. I, I said it, and all the listeners to me, and this goes for myself as well, is, is to really learn to be intentional. 
And what I mean by intentional, it really has three components. One is is developing a certain awareness, deciding on what you want, and then taking action. But being intentional is not just something with apartment building investing or real estate investing, but it's something that in life in, in general. And most people are not intentional. We tend to drift through life. We follow the herd. We do things that we've always done that our friends do and everybody else does or society does and we never question the things that we do and if you look at them closely some of them might simply be insanity you know we <laughs> take a job we take a promotion even though the promotion would take us away from building passive income we send our kids to piano class and gymnastics and sports when you know we don't even have enough hours in the day we do all these things because we never actually question what do we want in life and we just do the things that are, that come natural. So really thinking down and becoming aware of what we want in our life and if we really want passive income, then the next step is to decide what we're going to do because it's going to require changes in our life. So the next step after developing an awareness of what we really want in life is deciding what we want. And then the only natural response to deciding what we want is to take action. So really the message is to be intentional about our lives in general and about our finances and about our investing. Most people get so caught up trying to make a living that they forget to live a life, and that's not a life well lived. You need to take that 30,000-foot view. That's a great thing for us to think about. Michael, what's the best way for our audience to find out more about you? Uh, probably the website is themichaelblank.com. That's uh, B-L-A-N-K. And again, the ebook is at slash G-R-E. But if you go to themichaelblank.com, all my free resources are there, the podcast, I have my own podcast and a YouTube channel and bigger pockets articles, all that stuff. You can also contact me there. Well, you're an excellent teacher, Michael. I really want to thank you for coming on today. My pleasure, Keith. Thanks so much for having me. Over the last few months, I've had apartment building entrepreneurs and syndicators on our show here, like Russell Gray, Joe Fairless, and some others. So now that Michael has said some new things, but he also said some of the same things that those other guests have, and that way we kind of get a cross-section nationally of a few commonalities that others are seeing, namely a couple of them, okay? Number one is if you're syndicating, if you're aggregating other people's money, today it's easier to find the investor money than it is the deals. That's what others have said. The money's easier than the deals. And then the second common thread that they have is they go to loopnet.com. That's where the deals are, but they really go there to find the brokers more so than the deals. Deals are found through relationships. So get a relationship with a broker, a broker that has a lot of listings on Loopnet. Promote yourself toward those key brokers because real estate, it is a relationship business. So those are a couple commonalities that we're seeing today. And hey, credit Michael for discussing a challenge with an apartment building, okay? Some people just don't want to talk about their problems, and problems always happen. The lesson here is that he learned that his apartment building's existing manager, that's one that did not understand dealing with Section 8 compliance and tenancies. Section 8 means government-assisted housing, tenants that get assistance with their rent from the government. So if you're buying a building with that type of tenant in it, then find a manager with experience in Section 8. That could be pretty important. We got some more good tips from Michael on raising the rent and cutting the property expenses too. And I've got one to add here myself, okay? One common expense that novice apartment investors miss is janitorial service and grounds maintenance. I know that's a mistake that I've made on 10 plus unit buildings that I bought for myself. And this can even happen in a building as small as a fourplex, okay? You often have this indoor common area that needs to be cleaned. That includes hallways, stairwells, and the laundry room, maybe a vending area too. Those areas just don't clean themselves. Refuse accumulates in the halls. Dust settles on railings. Dust balls come out from behind the clothing dryer, okay? And then outdoors, there's usually a dumpster for an apartment building that you wouldn't have with single family homes and errant trash just kind of blows around the premises. Well, you need to pay someone every seven to 10 days to go over there and clean that up. Now, maybe you get a tenant to do that. Maybe your manager already has a janitor built into their management system that goes over there regularly. I mean, that's how I have it done with my apartment buildings. But either way, 
it's an expense that you need to account for that first timers just are not thinking about when they're kind of running the numbers and evaluating deals. Okay. That's the lesson there. When a tenant rents a single family home, they often, they treat that kind of as their own and they take better care of it when it's a single family home. Tenants in a communal apartment building, they just don't often feel the same way. They don't quite treat it as their own and some of them never will. Yet, as an investor, your long-term economies of scale and profitability may very well reside in apartment building. Michael's ebook is called The Secret to Raising Money to Buy Your First Apartment Building. You can grab that free at themichaelblanc.com slash GRE. Well, that's it for this week. I think you already know that Robert Kiyosaki and I will be talking to you here on next week's show. Until then, don't quit your daydream. You've been listening to Get Rich Education, telling you what the wealthy won't tell you about real estate and investing. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to visit iTunes and leave your comments. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. 